It's live letter time. We've got a lot of stuff to talk about today. More than just the delay, there's game details, but also we've got the latest census data. And that gives us an idea of how many people are actually playing FF14, how it's grown. Uh, spoilers, it's a lot. And by the way, uh, two days, stay tuned two days if you want a single player narrative RPG from us. Well, we are doing our reveal of the game we're making, uh, the publisher we have, uh, the trailer, the reveal trailer. It's all going to be two days, um, the 11th of November, 3 p.m. UK time on this channel. So yeah, we're finally getting to do game stuff. Holy shit. But okay, let's talk about FF14. We're going to start with the delay. And poor Yoshi P. I mean, god damn, the man clearly had the weight of the world on his shoulders, didn't he? As I'm sure you know by now, Endwalker has been delayed by two weeks from the 23rd to the 7th, which also shifts early access to the 3rd of December. 2021 is the year of game delays, but this definitely does come as a surprise. Now, the reason is that Yoshi P felt they needed extra time for QA to ensure that the launch is actually going to be a stable affair and a good experience for everyone. He basically said that his job as director took over and he just could not risk compromising the game. Of course, not just the game, but also the fact that Endwalker is the culmination of the whole FF14 story thus far, so really not the time for it to fall over. Now, the toll that it took on him was crystal clear. I mean, just look at him. Uh, you know, man brought to tears, which was honestly a little bit hard to, to watch. But uh, you know what? Seeing a director show himself uh, like that on stream is a breath of fresh air compared to the, honestly, the corporate bollocks we're used to. When Shadowlands was delayed by a month, we got a text post from the executive producer and without so much as an apology. When Blizzard delayed Overwatch 2 and Diablo 4 recently, we found out via an investors meeting. Which I think that shows, you know, just who they think is important. So it was great to see uh, Yoshi paying attention just so closely to the live streams chat as well, responding to a few queries, um, you know, just about how close all of this was to launch. But it does, I think, overall show how people trust the decision making from that team. Uh, when he spoke to the Square Enix board of directors on this issue, the issue of the delay, one of them said, it's late, but it'll work because Yoshida's working on it. So the guy clearly has got cloud internally. And of course, that's not to mention the likes of the chat being flooded with hearts and, and everything. But let's talk about the actual delay. I imagine most of us trust that it was necessary, but also that it is insanely close to the wire. Now, two weeks is not a major delay, but... There's going to be a ton of casualties in terms of players' plans. I mean, this is an MMO, so people will have been booking days, even weeks off work to fully immerse themselves, and, well, a bunch of those plans are in jeopardy. For some people, getting time off work is really hard in the first place, and rescheduling it so close to the wire is also really, really hard. Uh, not to mention launching an MMO in December, generally being a bit of a rough thing to do because it is a busy, stressful time for most people. So in that vein, dropping Pandemonium on the 21st is also going to, yeah, annoy more than a few people. But if the director and producer thinks the game needs more time, he is probably right and we don't want to have the whole thing fall over. Generally, here we are pro, we're pro game delays, okay? Uh, nothing's worse than a game that's undercooked. I've heard tales of Roban Savage and Pippin Extreme, and, uh, well, from what I've heard in the tales, I can imagine no one wants that to happen again. Also, if I'm being honest, if I'm gonna come in here for Team Scrub, gives the scrubs like me a bit more time, and uh, honestly, it kind of suits us very well in terms of content. <laughs> <laughs> now, all that said, before we get to the rest of the live letter, we've got tasty news from Lucky Bancho. There are now 1.62 million active characters. That's according to the Lucky Bancho census. That is up by 420,000 from July, which is about an extra 30%. Now, this is like active. So keep in mind, of course, there's been no content patch since May, yet uh, this particular number has exploded. Lucky Bancho's criteria for being active is pretty much this. Something changed since the last survey, right? But they also only count characters above level 60 to avoid free trials. 
And that means that anyone who is still progressing through A Realm Reborn or Heavensward won't be on the list. And, I mean, I only joined the Lucky Bant Show list like, what, one and a half weeks ago? Because of, you know, my character's level. Now, Bancho says the explosion of active players is likely down to new players, which is hardly a surprise, but also highlights that there are 1.51 million characters who have started Shadowbringers, which is up by 380k since July. Oh, and then for another number, 864,000 characters are flagged for Endwalker access. Now, if we want to get an active player count, we do have to do some very big estimates here. Uh, but Bancho points out that in a 2019 survey, it was found that about 20% of characters were alts. So by that measure, FF14 right now should have about 1.28 million active players who are like paying a subscription because that number excludes those who are still in the free trial. And that also does not include Chinese players either. The last number to cover then is registered accounts. So in April, Square Enix celebrated passing 22 million accounts. At that time, Lucky Bant Show found 951k active players. Well, last month, they announced they passed the 24 million account mark. So it seems that a lot of those 2 million players are still stuck around. Honestly, pretty massive. The growth's only continuing. They've mentioned as much multiple times. Perhaps we'll just have to wait for one or two earnings calls. Maybe they'll get really bullish and they'll finally want to unfurl a really juicy number. But till then, that's all we've got for numbers. All right, time for the rest of the live letter. Honestly, what a grueling show. Going through over five hours of nitty gritty updates is, uh, is wild and pretty damn brilliant. So this is a lot of stuff. What we've tried to do here is uh, pack it all down and give you the highlights. First up, the Endwalker launch trailer was released, and uh, I've been told I'm not allowed to watch it, but unfortunately I did watch it, and uh, the last segment has got me and everybody else concerned, and I suppose I'm going to find out uh, why soon enough. So, pretty big. Now, the coolest new bit was that apparently NPCs will actually travel with us instead of just sort of phasing about the place. Uh, that means like properly out in the world, like they're our real party, even including for conversations and GPOs. That is awesome, and I really want to see how the, well, how they can work that into their quest design. Now, then we got updates on sweeping PvP changes for 6.1. So first up, the new mode is called Crystal Conflict. The goal is to push the crystal into the enemy base to win, while of course also dealing with some map gimmicks. It's also, by the way, coming with a fairly major overhaul of PvP, and they do sound brave. So we've got role-based matchmaking and actions being removed in favor of generic PvP-specific actions with one job-specific adrenaline rush to set them apart. So yeah, that really is ballsy. Now, Yoshi P talked about basically PvP being too stressful for players with role restrictions, uh, while also then wanting short and simple matches because that will mesh better with FF14 player behavior. As for the rewards then, they're rolling out seasons for Crystal Conflict, and then a longer series for all combined PvP. So you'll get season rankings for Crystal Conflict, and that's going to come along with titles, achievements, and rewards but then PvP itself as a whole will offer rewards on a series basis, utilizing series XP and a battle pass-like system, but one that has got no fear of missing out because old rewards are going to be purchasable later on. Oh, and the feast is going away in 6.1, so hopefully very few will miss it after all these changes. But uh, it's okay, because they are currently in talks to bring some of FF14's most glamorous gear back with the new Garo collab. And uh, here's a pick. So, looks neat. Right, this level of change, honestly, is pretty brave. Like, it's a lot of changes for PvP. I've not really jumped into that segment of the game, but uh, I guess they feel PvP isn't up to scratch, and at least I'll be able to give you a perspective of somebody completely fresh to this. Now, there's also news of a new calling card system to personalize your player profile, uh, like the uh, examine window. Now, this is a pretty cool casual way to announce something that's actually a really neat addition. I guess it's like, I don't know, all the Call of Duty games and the shooters where you can customize your little banner. 
uh, but customization elements for this system are going to be rewarded through content in the future. Now, there was also some detail on HQ item removal. Basically, the removal of HQ gathering items has got a whole bunch of specifics detailed to make sure that it actually makes sense. Uh, instead of focusing on gathering HQ, you'll instead get a bonus yield of normal items with your perception and other HQ bonuses. So as far as I can see, this is doing two major things. Number one, it's gonna help you clean up your inventory, right? So you'll be able to put even more materials in there. It won't be clogged up by regular and HQ versions of things and uh, in Adwalker. So that's kind of handy because your inventory can get real nasty if you're gathering out here. Now it also removes the bad experience of not getting HQ items. If the extra items are a bonus instead, then you're never, you know, you're never getting something that's not useful. You're just getting a bit less. Now for fishing, instead of bonus yield, you'll be getting large sized or more collectible fish instead. And also spear fishing has got its own mini game as well, which uh, looks interesting to say the least. Then, now this bit was a cool touch. They announced that any XP you have on a level will be removed with the XP downscaling, which is a bit odd, but they explained why here. Basically, Calculating the new XP value after the downscale for every character's level would add a huge amount of time to their, well, their database uh, processing time during maintenance. So they're just going to reset it to zero instead. It's easy to laugh at that idea, um, but there you go. I guess we are losing some XP in order to get Endwalker maintenance be over soon. So there you go. It's a bit of an odd change, but that's happening. Okay, the housing system. This is one of the most interesting segments. So, of course, in patch 6.1, they're adding Imperium, which is the housing district in Ishgard. So that's pretty exciting. But it comes with some major, well, it comes after some major updates to make getting houses fairer. Uh, first off, transferring land buying permissions and FC ownership to new FC members is going to be restricted in order to stop, uh, well, just being just, you know, trading FCs or joining one just so you can buy land. After a long wait then, we've also got specifics on how the lottery system is going to work. So to be able to enter the private lottery, you need to be level 50 plus. You need to be second lieutenant in your grand company. You can't buy a plot on the same world as any of your other characters, right? So that's the restrictions. Now for an FC plot, the FC's got to have four or more members who are at least rank six. And then also, like with the private housing, the buyer can't own an FC plot in the same world. Now, the lottery will be scheduled across worlds and housing areas, so there's going to be no overlap. That means that it will take a while to get sorted, but hopefully it's all going to work out. Now, there are a few days to view a plot and put the full price down up front, and then the winner will have a few days to confirm their victory, else they'll lose half their money and the plot will be back into the next lottery period. Also, a player can only put down one entry at a time. You also can't pull out of a lottery, so once you put your money down, you've put it down. You have to be committed. Actually, so much that you also have to manually collect your refund if you lose. Now, that feels a bit unfair, but uh, apparently it's actually for technical reasons, so there's that. Now, they've yet to decide how many of the plots are going to be sold via lottery, but it seems like they could be considering all of them. I mean, assuming this system works, uh, it will be. All in all, then, these overall do seem like, uh, I mean, for a lot of people, a lottery, like, it's going to kind of suck, but the alternative also is just, like, well, the botting and the, you know, waiting for ages. So overall, these do seem to be very popular changes to combat the issues that people are finding in actually buying a house. Uh, now, a lot of these could feel, I think, a bit unfair or maybe very aggressive on paper, but I think it's just ending up taking a solution like that to solve a decently deep-rooted problem with the housing system. All right, time for the last few bits. So, number one, they've confirmed the name for the first tier of Pandemonium, and what's fun there is that according to Matt, this name is very important, and Soft confirms one of his theories for the raid. So, because of that, I'm pretty excited. Also, let's uh, just take a moment to appreciate the new uncapped tombstone gear. It's all actually lifted straight out of FF4. 
uh, Cecil's Paladin gear for tanks, Rydia's gear for casters, and those are some clear highlights, so that's pretty neat. The attention to detail, even just in a live letter, is amazing, but there are some funny things, like holding up printouts to the camera. It's like a weird level of old school. Uh, and now to end us off, we do come to the most important announcement of the entire live letter, and that is that in December, they're releasing a spin-off manga that is focused on the twins in a Japanese high school setting, because yes, we're getting one of those. Uh, there is no official news on an English release, uh, but um, I'm sure we'll figure something out and that an English release would probably do very well. So, this live letter was, despite the grim news, I think another great example of the team's just overall communication. Now look, our coverage here is far from exhaustive, but we just wanted to give you our two cents and things and also give you a quick rundown on some of the most important topics. And uh, well, I look forward to actually fully understanding one of these darn live letters someday because I am racing towards the finish. Well, not really racing, I suppose, because of the delay, which uh, is allowing things to be a bit more chill. So yeah, I, I apologize if you're one of the people impacted by the delay, but honestly, to me, it, uh, it does kind of feel good. It's giving me time to properly, well, to properly finish and then digest for a good few days Shadowbringers uh, and share my experience all in time so I can join you in the grand finale, which is going to be awesome. So. There's all that great stuff going on. I hope you enjoyed the video and stick around in two days on the 11th, 3 p.m. on this channel, we are revealing our game. Yes, we're making single player narrative RPG and uh, you'll learn more about it. Well, the name is The Pale Beyond. You'll learn more about it, our publisher and uh, all of that stuff on Thursday. So yeah, look out for that. Other than that, uh, thank you for watching and I will see you next time.